Welcome to the Cornell Fine Arts Museum. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Coulter. I'm the Dale Montgomery Fellow here. I work within the curatorial department. And as my duties, I've been here about a year and a half. And I oversee the docent program. I engage in a lot of our community outreach. And then, as well as that, I also conduct a number of research projects on the permanent collection. So, it's my absolute pleasure today to share my research with all of you on the portrait of Annie Russell as Lady Vivere uh, by John White Alexander. The work came into the permanent collection in 1938 as a generous gift from Annie Russell's nephew, John Russell Carty. Um, so. John White Alexander was an American painter and illustrator, best known for his tonal and psychological portraits of American society women. In 1875, he moved from Pennsylvania to New York to study art and shortly thereafter worked as a political cartoonist for Harper's Weekly. He then traveled to Europe and received his formal art training in Paris and Munich. And by 1881, Alexander opened a studio in the German Bank Building in New York, where he reserved, uh, received his first commission for a painted portrait. During the mid-1880s, he moved into a studio in the Chelsea Building on West 23rd Street and opened a studio also in Seabright, New Jersey. Soon the artist became recognized as a high society portrait painter. In an article, Town Topics, the author described a visit to John White Alexander's studio. After sitting with great docility for half an hour, the model began a furtive inspection of the portraits standing in the studio. Old John Gilbert looked down at him pleasantly. Ex-President McCosh presented his thoughtful profi profile. Cortland Palmer was before him, and his 19th century uh, club attitude and costume. Walt Whitman crouched grimly in a corner. Annie Russell offered her fair form to his unaccustomed gaze, and a dozen other partly finished portraits leaned against the wall, awaiting the sittings of their originals. So here we have him in his studio. Among the portraits from this earlier part of his career is the painting of Annie Russell as Lady Vivere in Broken Hearts. John White Alexander, in addition to being an artist, was really interested in the theater scene of New York. And he was painting portraits very thoroughly, but he also painted a series of murals as well as designed sets for a number of theatrical produ productions. So his deep interest in the theater, I think, is what uh, created this connection with Annie Russell. Um, but this also informed his sort of approach to painting style as well. So he was really in tune with color and light. And we can see that here in this portrait of Annie Russell. Um, see, here we see this full length portrait. Her face is in shadow as she looks down towards these flowers that she's gathering in her, her arm um, from this large glass bowl on stand. Originally, this painting was actually dated to 1900. And with my research, I found that I believe the state is actually much earlier. Um, several sources, including famous American women, listed Annie Russell performing in Broken Hearts in 1885. The catalog of paintings, John White Alexander Memorial Exhibition, published by the Department of Fine Arts Carnegie Institute in 1916, recorded an inc incomplete list of John White Alexander's portraits painted before 1887. And on it, it records two portraits of Annie Russell. The other portrait at one time also belonged to her, uh, but it's unclear where the painting is now located. So that's a mystery unsolved. The Smithsonian Archives of American Art has dig digitized a significant portion of John White Alexander's papers. And this includes scrapbooks, notes, photographs from his history, um, photographs of other people that he sketched or painted. Um, 
And in one of the scrapbooks, it featured an article dated to 1888 that notes, among the portraits painted by Alexander during the past 18 months are those of Miss Annie Russell of the Madison Square Theater. And the archives also had a note among his list of paintings that stated, Portrait of Annie Russell as Broken Hearts by W.S. Gilbert, painted by J.W.A. about 1885, property of Annie Russell Theater, Winter Park, Florida. Um, so you can see that note in the top right corner there. And that was after a couple hours of mining through the digitized archives. So I was really pleased that I found that little note. In eminent actors in their homes, personal descriptions and interviews written in 1909, the author notes, Miss Russell's character has been identified with many of the dramatic successes of New York City. She made her debut at the age of 10 and shortly after sang as Josephine in a juvenile pinafore company. In Esmeralda, she won her first great triumph and established a permanent reputation. In this play, she appeared nearly a thousand times. In 1883, Annie Russell joined the New York Fifth Avenue Theater Company and toured in the play Hazel Kirk in the title role before marrying her first husband in 1884. And around this period in her life, it was the first of many reported illnesses that the actor faced. Um, and she returned to the stage again in New York in 1885 for this title role of Lady Vivere in Broken Hearts, written by W.S. Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan. Gilbert spent a year writing the manuscript for Broken Hearts. And at its completion, he noted, finished Monday, 15th November, 1875, at 12.40 AM. Thank God. <laughs> um, and in 1891, Gilbert told Harry Howe in a Strand interview, I consider the two best plays I ever wrote to be Broken Hearts and a version of Faust legend called Gretchen. Broken Hearts was actually written for his very great friend, John Hare. Uh, and it was a fairy play that was a little bit more of a drama than a comedy that he was mostly known for. And um, then following that, the American actress Mary Anderson, after having a conversation with Gilbert, claimed he had put more of his real life into Broken Hearts than any other play. The play debuted at the Court Theatre in London on December 9th, 1875, so just shortly after he completed it, um, and was performed again throughout England in 1876, 1882, and 1885, and then in New York in 1885 at the Madison Square Theater. It was also later burlesqued um, by A. Clement and F. Hay, who titled the satire Cracked Heads, um, <laughs> which may or may not become a little more clear to you as I share the plot of this play. The manuscript opens with, scene, a tropical landscape, in the distance a calm sea, a natural fountain, a mere thread of water, falls over a rock into a natural basin. An old sundial, formed of the upper part of a broken pillar, round the shaft of which some creeping flowers are trained, stands. The time is within half an hour of sunset. The three-act fairy play, set in the 14th century, follows the lives of four women um, over the course of 24 hours. The women lost their loves and moved to the imaginary tropical island titled Broken Hearts, Void of Men, to forget the world. <laughs> the play mainly focuses on the sisters Lady Hilda and Lady Vivere, and though they forsworn the love of men, the women fall in love with inanimate objects. <laughs> yes, you heard. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lady Hilda states in Act One, to this far isle I said in thoughtless jest, as women's heart must love, and we are women, so let us choose our loves. Then looking round, this running fountain shall be mine, <laughs> I cried. And Lady Vivere exclaimed, I take this dial to he my love for life. <laughs> so the fountain that Lady Hilda loves um, is a symbol for, um, 
hold on, I just lost my place, is a symbol for vitality, while the sundial is a symbol for mortality. So we have this opposites uh, of the sisters themselves. Um, and throughout the play, Lady Vivere continues to contemplate and discuss her awareness of her own pending mortality. In one passage, she states, I do not love the world. My darling sister found her sorrow there. The world is not to me. This tiny isle, but half a league in girth, holds all I love. My world is where thou art. There let me stay for the few months that I have remained to me. I think my time on earth will be but brief. Despite these weighty thoughts, life on the island appears pretty peaceful until <laughs> the arrival of a man, Prince Florian. Not only is he a prince, but he has this very fancy accessory of a scarf that with the right motion be becomes invisible or he becomes invisible and all you can hear is his voice. So he plays a little trick on Lady Vivere who he realizes is pledging her love to the sundial and he acts as the voice of the sundial. Um, and when he realizes that his joke goes too far, he removes the scarf and before he can really explain himself, um, Lady Vivere believes that the voice of the sundial has manifested into a man <laughs> and that her dreams have come true, that she finally has her true love in front of her. Um, but as if this wasn't uh, complicated enough, as fate would have it, Prince Florian is actually the long lost love of her sister, Lady Hilda. And that is the main reason they're at the island in the first place. Um, so Lady Vivere realizes this and acknowledges the couple was meant to be together and eventually dies of a broken heart. I know, it's so sad. <laughs> So <laughs> the New York production directed by A.M. Palmer of the Madison Square Theater received mixed reviews, but at, um, in the Daily Evening Bulletin, it wrote, the actors were imbued with a spirit of the composition and invested it with a poetic atmosphere in harmony with the conception. The scenes might easily be made ludicrous, and it is to the credit of the actors that the interest of reality was imparted to them. Society will be revived for this evening. While another review wrote, Broken Hearts is probably too delicate a work for general public acceptance, but that fact does not evaluate it, its worth. Mr. Palmer at the Madison Square Theater has given a lovely scenic investiture to this play. And the play must have had a lasting impression because uh, it was reviewed again in 1892 by the Daily International Ocean, and it wrote, several years ago, Mr. A. M. Palmer produced this play most poetically and gave it an almost perfect cast that included Miss Annie Russell, Miss Burroughs, and Mr. Lemoyne, but the hopeless sadness of the theme outweighed the beauty of their work and its production in the esteem of the public. The reviews of Annie Russell's performance, however, were overall very positive. The New York Tribune wrote, Miss Annie Russell invested Vivere with spiritual sweetness and with sustained pathos from first to last. Vivere is a sufferer, not an actor, and the thing to be suggested by her representative is loveliness of condition. Miss Harrison and Miss Russell were repeatedly recalled upon the scene and the curtain was rung up repeatedly at the end of each of the three acts in response to the hearty plaudits of a delighted audience. The entire performance was one of strength and beauty. This review also serves as an example as to how Annie Russell became known for her ingenue roles. An ingenue in theater is typically a role of a woman who is innocent, kind, gentle, often naive and wholesome, and it orig originates from the French adjective ingenue or ingenuous or innocent, virtuous and candid. The role of Lady Vivere with her spiritual sweet sweetness, pathos and loveliness of condition fall within this category of ingenue. And over the course of her career, uh, she played so many ingenues that she became um, known to call it Annie Genoues. <laughs> uh, 
And this became really a frustration of Annie Russell, um, who was really striving for more deep and complex parts to, um, to act. So um, she was quoted, I saw no hope of ever being recognized as any other capacity unless I did something to prove that I had a temperamental force. And the role of the ingenue and its complexities reflected really the cultural perception of women of the late 19th century and appeared throughout material culture, especially in painting. John White Alexander's depiction of Annie Russell in her role as Lady Vivere in Broken Hearts falls within the movement of decorative painting that grew out of this time period. Um, the inspiration for decorative painting stems from the aesthetic movement, but was considered to really be a style that was truly American. During the late 19th century in Europe, artists moved away from the neoclassicist style of painting and instead started emphasizing um, technique instead of historic narrative. And the rise of this representation of women overshadowed the heroic male nude. Um, but American artists, inspired from their travels abroad, adopted similar techniques of painting. And because American art wasn't really grounded in the same deeply steep traditions of European painting, it allowed them to take this movement to new heights and had a very strong presence. So decorative painting, if you're wondering, is a type of painting constructed primarily um, to create an aesthetic and harmonious effect. And it featured female figures as formal elements within the composition. And these compositions often had arbitrary titles. For example, here on the screen, I have The Mirror, Symphony in White Number no. One, The White Girl, and Lady with a Lute. The compositions usually had genteel women in elaborate dress, so these could be costumes that are inspired by another era or could be inspired by non-Western traditions uh, with this increase of Japanese. And artists typically pictured their sitters within the, a shallow space or really close to the viewer with an accessory that recalled a subtle motif, whether it was seasonal, floral, or um, musical. The women were usually represented in uncluttered interiors with select decorative objects in moments of contemplation and the overall composition would be unified by a harmonious color palette. By the end of the 19th century, the distinctions of studies, portraits, and genre paintings really started to blur. And this portrait by John White Alexander fulfills all the characteristics of a decorative painting, which I'll go into further detail about. So the first noticeable component is the way that Annie Russell is dressed. And John White Alexander apparently had some opinions about the way women were dressing, and his opinions became published many times in the newspaper. Um, he suggested the elimination of ornament, reduction of conflicting hues, and a graceful silhouette promised the best decorative effects. In this painting, we see those soft hues of lavender, pink, neutral tones working together to create this harmonious color palette. But here we also see Russell dressed in her costume, which made for really an ideal topic for the artist to explore. Um, so on the first page of the manuscript of Broken Hearts, it notes costumes 1300 to 1350. And we see this inspiration of medieval dress in the painting here with the loose flowing gown, um, the sort of belt that's wrapped around her waist, the romantic sleeves. And this interest in the medieval period really reached across all artistic mediums in the late 19th century especially in London. The presence of aestheticism, William Morris, the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, really had this heightened interest in motifs and stories of the medieval time. And often artists <laughs> generated this romanticized vision of what that life was like in the medieval period and provided this increasingly modern time an outlet for escape or expression. 
So we see that happening here. Um, but in addition to the play Broken, Broken Hearts, Annie Russell also starred as the title role of Elaine in 1887, so just a year later. So here I have a picture uh, from the Rollins College archives on the left, and then two images from the Museum of the City of New York on the right. Uh, so there are posed portraits, but you can see, um, here I have my comparison slide, how similar some of the dress was, uh, especially with that belt. Another detail of note is the setting of this painting. Here, instead of being placed within the set of the play, the background is left blank. And the viewer gains the sense still that it's in an interior. Um, though, upon first glance, that this is set on the inside, um, the setting um, may seem insignificant, but it really reflects the ideology of gender and space in the Victorian era. Darwin's work in biological determinism made lasting impressions on perceived characteristics of men and women, um, roles of opposing traits in his eyes. Men were seen as powerful, active, independent, and served in public roles, while women were seen as weak, passive, emotional, and occupied the private sphere. The interior became more than just a space to occupy. It was associated as a realm of imagination, emotion, and spirituality. In art and literature, uh, interior spaces were synonymous with the inner chambers of the female mind. So these ideas are further emphasized by the depiction of Annie Russell within this space. The closeness of space suggests mental seclusion and privacy. Her body is turned, closed off, which makes her inaccessible and recluse. Her face is enveloped in shadow and emphasizes this sense of mystery and imagination. And this interest in imagination is further supported by the presence of flowers in this painting, which during this time often signified the dreamer. And in this painting, Annie Russell directs her gaze towards the flowers in the large glass bowl. Um, so flowers also appear as this common motif surrounding the character Lady Vivere throughout the play, Broken Hearts. Um, they serve as a reflection of time, fragility, and inevitable mortality. So this presence of the flowers starts in Act One, as I read to you earlier. Seen a tropical landscape, in the distance a calm sea, a natural fountain, a mere thread of water falls over a rock into the basin. An old sundial formed of the upper part of a broken pillar, round the shaft of which some creeping flowers are trained stands. The time is within a half hour of sunset. So we have our attention drawn to the time of day. Um, here we have flowers wrapped around on this sundial, the symbol of mortality that <laughs> Lady Vivere loves so dearly. Um, and let's see, um, this painting also appears to me to recall a, a saying that Lady Vivere shares in, I think, act one of the play. She states, I'll weave a bower of rose and eglantine to place above thy head at eventide when the full moon's abroad. The painting pictures her gathering these light pink flowers, and the placement of the composition is very intentional to me. Um, so I'll go back to the slide. So if you look at this painting, it's evenly divided here. Annie Russell occupies the space on the left, and on the right, almost equally balanced with her, is this bowl, glass bowl of flowers on the stand that occupies a similar amount of space. So they're evenly divided, which creates this conversation between the two. And you can even see that the artist has very thoughtfully played with line throughout the composition. So her face is looking down at the flowers, her arm leads us to the flowers, and then with the, the line of the vines of the flowers, they curve back up. Let me see if I can... So they curve back up here and bring our eye back up to the face or the expression of Annie Russell. So he's very in tune with the composition itself. Um, so 
To add to this, John White Alexander frequently featured flowers in his paintings to further emphasize uh, subjects' fragility. Um, so um, here we have this, this sense of fragility and delicate beauty in conversation with each other, sharing equal planes on the painting. And um, she adds to this sense of fragility with what she says in Act Three. The fates have decreed that the little fading flower shall die, and the noble sister shall be rewarded with loving presence of her prince. And in the very final lines of the play, her sister, Lady Hilda, cries out, O oh death, O oh death, leave me this little flower. Take thou fruit, but pass thy blossom by. And however, um, what, what seems even more fascinating to me is that these ideas continued into the way audiences perceived Annie Russell. In the Daily International Ocean, the review stated, Miss Annie Russell, as Lady Vivere, presented a characterization that might be fit fittingly compared to some delicate, odorless, wild flower of the forest, a shrinking, sensitive soul that might have well died for love. Miss Russell graced the role most touchingly and artistically, worthily winning praise bestowed. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we can begin to see why Annie Russell had some frustrations with becoming attached to this role of the, the ingenue. Uh, the ideal ideology was so steeped in the American psyche of the 19th century as evidenced through this painting by John White Alexander. And it was figures like Annie Russell that really helped to inspire change uh, through perseverance through perseverance, easy for me to say. Um, after more battles with her health in the late 1880s th through the early 1890s, she returned to the stage again in 1894. And during this period, she pursued and acted in a series of successful, diverse roles in several new plays. In addition to acting, Russell orchestrated the Old English Comedy Company, which performed the works of Shakespeare, Goldsmith, Sheridan, and others from 1912 through her retirement in 1918. She also mentored young women uh, with ambitions for the stage to study from life, not theater. Be natural, be human, play within the limitations of your part. Study it all in careful detail, work, work, work. <laughs> Creativity, if you can, intelligently, always. And she remained very active in her retirement in Winter Park. And through the encouragement of her close friend, Mary Curtis Bach Zimbalis, she became involved with the dramatic arts program at Rollins College. In 1931, with the generous funding of Zimbalis, the Annie Russell Theater was built. Annie Russell passed away in 1936, but her legacy and vision lives on Rollins College through the dedication to collaboration, creativity, education, and discipline. Now, the longest continuously operating theater in Florida and named to the National Register of Historic Places in 1998, the Annie Russell Theater stages an exciting season of musical and plays that feature student performers. Please take time to see 9 to 5 the musical. It's now on view um, at the Annie Russell Theater. It's based on the 1980 hit and features music by Miss Dolly Partner, Parton. <laughs> um, and it's really a comedy musical about friendship uh, and really inspires you to stand up for yourself, for the people you love, or to really follow a dream. Uh, there are three performances left, so there's one tonight at 8, and there's two tomorrow at 2 and 8, so I highly encourage you to go. I went last night. It was fabulous. I really enjoyed it. Um, and there will also be collecting gently used professional women's attire, so if you have that, please donate as well. Um, for those of you who are interested in the performing arts, I wanted to share an upcoming exhibition at our museum with you as well. Uh, it's titled Jamila Sabur, Water, Sun, Moon, and will be on view in the fall season. And Jamila Sabur negotiates complex relationships between the body and landscape and interrogates notions of territoriality. 
These themes re reoccur in her practice, but for this exhibition, she focuses more specifically on Florida and the topics of, uh, or the tropics of America's as space, spaces of contestation. Uh, this exhibition will feature new and recent work, as well as uh, a performance on October 2nd. So um, stay tuned. Um, but that's it for my presentation. Thank you so much for coming today. Please take a moment to fill out the comment cards. We love your feedback. And thank you. I'd be happy to welcome any questions at this time, if you have any. Yeah. Yes. I, I haven't yet. No, I, and it's really bothering me because <laughs> I was trying to find it for a comparison to see how he would interpret the different roles or just kind of give more information. I'm dying to know. Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it will be in the upcoming rotation, but have to see if it's up for discussion. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. When when I do my research, I try and keep an open mind because I'm never quite sure where it's going to take me and um, when I was looking into this painting, I, of course, uh, consult sort of the main resources on the artists that are in question, and then I look into sort of the influence of the period, what other artists are creating, um, and then when I was looking into the artists, I saw that there was this archive, so I just pretty much started there and then fell down all the different rabbit holes of research <laughs> that happens, but it's really nice today with the resources that are becoming more digitized and it makes my job a little bit easier, but there's still still more, I think, out there for this painting. And how long did you spend? Oh gosh. Um, in addition to other, it's hard to know, um, in addition to the other things, um, I try and prioritize research a little bit each week, but I've been looking into this a little over a year, I guess. Yeah, yes. Oh, um, I think the Rollins College Archives actually has some information about her house where she lived, but I just don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. I think it might be. Any, any Russell fans out there? No? No? Okay. <laughs> Figured I'd ask. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time today.